Today I'm going to show you why your uric acid has been going up so insanely population wise in Europe, the United States, Australia, call it the West for the last 40 to certainly 70 years and perhaps even less. Why it's been going up and driving up kidney disease, eye problems, nerve problems, cardiometabolic problems, decline in cognitive health, early onset dementia, Alzheimer's, dementia in a few, obesity. Did I leave that one out? So why, I want you to know why that's increasing, what you can do to change that for yourself and therefore to change your life. Let's go. I wonder if we can take a trip together today, right now. It's gonna be a mental trip, but it's really important to set the stage of understanding how we got to where we are in terms of uric acid. So the trip we're gonna take, you ready? We're going back to the Paleolithic time. All right, now we're back to Paleolithic, and I wanna show you something. We're taking a trip back to the Paleolithic period, so let's define what exactly that is. What we mean by the Paleolithic era, or period, is really a period from 2.5 million years ago up till about 10,000 years ago. 10,000 years ago was the beginning of what we call the agriculture revolution. So for a period of 2 million, 490,000 years is what we're talking about. So briefly, as humans lived in caves, simple huts, teepees were hunters and gatherers. They used basic stone and bone tools. And that's pretty much it. But what I want to show you here is what is the key? The length of time, it's we spent a very long time in the Paleolithic period, almost right up until yesterday, right? If you want to put 10,000 years, what is the fraction of 10,000 years over 2.5 million years, I'll tell you what the answer is. It's four one thousandths, four one thousandths. So it's a very small sliver of time. And why do I even mention that? It's because many people think that we have never evolved in terms of our nutritional needs beyond the hunter-gatherer. That was the appropriate diet. Anything after that, and there's been a lot of really interesting studies, DNA, uh, size of human shrunk, and so on and so forth. But but I want to emphasize three key differences. Length of time, I've already covered that. Lifestyle, hunter-gatherers, pretty straight, straightforward. They were nomadic, they roved around. But the food, Paleolithic humans hunted wild animals, fished, gathered fruits and berries. As we can imagine, fruits and berries were back then. Berries probably haven't changed as much as fruits have. Whereas ne Neolithic, which is the next 10,000 years for the most part, not modern, was food through farming, which means agriculture, which means whole grains and domesticated animals. 2,490,000 years we ate paleo, and after that we began to eat grains. A big increase in our omega-6. Many believe that we have paleo genes still, and our diet requires a paleo diet. A couple of things. We talk about omega-3, and we talk about omega-6 as if they're diametrically oppositional, and they hate each other. One's all about inflammation and the other's all about anti-inflammation. That's pretty much true. And we get fish oil, which has EPA and DHA, right? That's the omega-3. And then we get arachidonic acid, which we get basically also in all animal meats, fish, chicken, poultry, game at large. All right, so that's it. But here, all the grass right here that grows in the spring and into the summer is omega-3 as well. They call it terrestrial. So it's alpha linolenic acid, otherwise known as ALA. So then along comes the fall, late summer. What happens? Well, it goes to seed and you get grasses. It could be rye, it could be wheat, it could be all grains. So now what we have is late summer and fall, we have seeds, we have grains. In these grains is omega-6 early spring, the luscious, green, juicy grasses are omega-3, ALA. The grains are omega-6. So what does this have to do with anything? Well, the meats that we have eaten in Paleolithic time, they grazed on grass They wrote because it was much more nutritious. So from spring, they got the early grasses and they roved around and they got the grasses. Well, along comes Modern agriculture, in the last thousand years, if not the last 10,000 years, mostly it's the last couple hundred years, they 
basically siloed all the grains and they gave the grains to the cattle in the barns. So whether it's sheep or lamb, uh, well, same thing, right? Sheep or cattle or pigs for the most part. Pigs got a lot of other different things, but they started eating grains. So they went from a rich omega-3 diet, ALA, to a really rich omega-6. That changed their whole fatty acid composition that we then consumed, and that's how it's been today in pigs and chickens and so on. For the most part, they are fed grains, and certainly cattle is fed grains as well. So that whole omega-3, omega-6 ratio that ideally is one to one is now 16, 20 to one. And this is what we eat. This is what I've covered before. So what does the high omega-6 to three ratio have to do with anything? And certainly what does it have to do with uric acid? Okay, let's jump right into it. So we talk about omega-3s and 6s, we have kind of two different sources. One that they call terrestrial, that comes from plants. So on the land, not in the water. And for the most part, the richest source of EPA, DHA is from marine animals. Yeah, you can get it from lakes and so on and so forth, but it's basically marine. So in the course of our evolution, we moved away from the shore lines into the heartland, if you will. So terrestrial fatty acids come through plants and they're called uh, ALA, alpha linolenic acid, um, from grasses, and that's omega-3, but it has to be converted to EPA and DHA. So this is fish oil. Fish oil doesn't have to be converted at all. ALA does have to be converted, and there's a big separate topic about how the ability to be able to convert ALA to EPA and then DHA varies between us a lot, and some people really can't do it. Most of us struggle with it and it's not a very efficient pathway. The other, which is linolenic acid, this is the omega-6 from grains, seed oils. This is what we're talking about. This has been the biggest change, depending on what you want to measure it. I measure it over the last 50 to 70 years, really. Um, linolenic acid, omega-6, goes to another omega-6 arachidonic acid. That's about as far as I want you to know, but to know that fish oil is what they call preformed sources of EPA and DHA. You eat it, it's immediately usable. ALA is not that way from plants. So omega-3 to the rescue, what are we talking about? Well, in terms of our kidneys, obviously everything's filtered through our kidneys. What goes out with the waste, which is urine, or what is retained, and it's not really one and all. It, everything goes out and then it gets reabsorbed. Everything goes out and gets reabsorbed. And so where omega-3, fish oil, EPA and DHA, come in is that they block, if you will, the reabsorption, taking back in the uric acid, okay? So it takes, it, it keeps it out there into the waste. That's a big, big deal. So omega-3, this is from a study in 2020, so this is not old information. Omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acid inhibits a particular reabsorption receptor. Okay, again, omega-3s here versus omega-6s. Omega-3s decrease uric acid by inhibiting the reabsorption. Omega-6 increase uric acid by, in the blood, in us, by reabsorbing it via the kidneys. Same idea from ALA, difficult change from terrestrial to preformed in fish, but it can be done. So if that was your only source, were green leafy vegetables, you hopefully would get enough. Here's a blinding chart basically saying all the red things can block the reabsorption of uric acid. And so what do we find? There's EPA, also there's linolenic acid. So there's omega-6 does not block it, which I just told you. And these are a number of various forms of arachidonic, uh, not arachidonic acid, EPA of omega-3. Arachidonic acid actually has a little blockage as well. So here's the change I want you to know in your mind, because when you go to the supermarket, I want you to know what you're buying, and I want you to know how it's affecting you. It's important. How we feed our livestock has changed completely from, let's say pigs, let's say pork, grazing on omega-3 grasses. You never see that. You've never seen that, certainly not in the United States anymore, except if you have a private farm someplace that does that, but it's extremely rare. From grazing on grasses, omega-3s, to grain-fed, to our current method, which is basically factory farmed, even higher concentrations of omega-6. So it's a huge change away from how we ate for those two point four, nine, two million, four hundred and ninety thousand years. Are you getting the point? Okay, so the ratio of omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids was over 16 to one for grain-fed 
tallow as beef fat, and only 1.4 for the grass-fed. So to be clear, what I'm saying is the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio was 16 to 1, omega-6 to omega-1 in grain-fed versus 1.4 to 1 pasture-fed. And that's from 2022, nutritional benefits from fatty acids in organic and grass-fed beef. That's phenomenal. Grain-fed meat, pork, farm-raised fish, goats, sheep, goats will eat anyway. So does any of this really matter? You bet it does. And so this is current of samples of the ratio of omega-6 to 3 in foods that we eat, meats primarily. Grass-fed beef, and here is grain-fed right here. There's that change. It's a big difference. But now you look at chickens. Chickens basically eat bugs, but when they're factory raised, they eat soy, corn, and they eat grains for the most part because it's the easiest thing to do. Look at that, 16, 17, 27. Pork chops is 27. And I go, I'm eating this? That's a big difference. Bigger picture, omega-6 to 3 ratio in various populations. And this is from 1998. So this is not new news. Population that they're referring, Paleolithic, which is the era. Paleolithic was better than a one-to-one. -one. In other words, it had more omega-3s than 6s. So that's why it's on a 0.79. Greece prior to 1960, specifically Crete, was one to two to one. And that was from end Dr. Uh, Artemis Anopoulos. Current United States, call it 17. And I'll show you some data that will show you pretty much about the same numbers. 1998, UK, 15. Japan, four, pretty healthy today. Rural India, 2003, five to six. Urban India, 40 to 50. Oh my gosh. And that was from 1998. Things probably have just gotten worse, right? That's 24 years ago. This is from 2016, linolenic acid. So that's an omega-6, right? Linolenic acid in the U.S. body fat, 1961 to 2008. So that's roughly 14 years ago. So I extrapolated that here. But anyways, let's stick with the facts. At the end of 2010 or 2008, it said the amount of omega-6 fatty acid in the body fat. So they took a sample of the fat and they said, what percent, real straightforward, what percent of the human body fat is linoleic acid, omega-6? It, it increased more than 200%, threefold in the past 50 years, 60 to 2008. Now, if you extrapolate that to 22, you're probably well over to 25. So how we choose to feed our livestock, a cattle, sheep, goats, poultry, farm fish, is really how we choose to feed ourselves in terms of a healthy ratio of six to three. So why I'm pointing this out, it's not like, oh my gosh, everything's terrible, stop watching now. It's saying, no, this reality exists for you, and now it is up to you to find out what your levels are and for you to change it, which you can do. So this is actionable information. This isn't me just going, oh, the world has really gotten toxic. We're going to walk around that topic for the time being. It's a choice. Does any of this really matter? Let's take a look at some labs. So what I did, I just reached in and took out 20, threw them into a spreadsheet. And what I arranged is the highest, right over here, this here is the highest omega-6 to 3 ratio. The highest 6 to 3 ratio. So we're roughly about 18. And then for these 20 some odd, the best ratio is 4.1. Not so bad, eh? But these are obviously people that are unaware of what all this is. And these are probably people that are pretty well educated and been taking their omega-3s. Okay. That's the inside scoop. Okay. So we do have bad numbers, but what does that correlate to? Look how low their omega-3 is. So the second line is the amount of the omega-3. You want to have that a lot higher. You want to have that at 8%. Spoiler alert, you want to have that at 8%. So they have very low omega-3. So what does that mean? They have a very high likelihood of a heart event, a cardiac event. It could be a heart attack. It could be something else. It's pretty much worldwide agreed upon. Your omega-3 level specifically, if it's low, means your risk for heart attacks is a lot higher. Okay, but what other things do we have in common? I want you to just have a bird's eye look. Notice where the red things are, mostly over to the right side of the page. You can say, yeah, there's some over here. But let's look at the vitamin Ds, which has nothing to do with the omega-6-3 ratio, but it's something that we know has a lot to do with dementia, has a lot to do with your state of health, your immune system, but now that's something they could do. So they can address that, right? They can increase their omega-3. They can increase their vitamin D if they need to. So look at this guy or woman. Basically an 18 to 1 bad ratio, very little omega-3, 
a high risk of heart attack and a very low vitamin D, boom, two things right away that person could do would probably transform their life. What else can we find? We can find, let's go to insulin resistance. Insulin, oh, let's go total cholesterol. That's always a fun one. Total cholesterol, you notice that for these, the worst people there had the lowest cholesterol, right? The whole idea, get your cholesterol down, get, get your cholesterol down, don't get your cholesterol down. That's misinformation, but once you start lining it up this way, look what happens. You go down to this side, the people who have the best omega-3 and the best ratio have the highest cholesterol, 280, 270, there's a low one, 280, 280, 310. Okay, what else? What about insulin resistance? Let's look at insulin resistance and we're gonna go for right here. There's three ways I calculate insulin resistance. We're just gonna use the middle one, which is the HOMA IR. And you'll find all the insulin resistance is over here. We don't have, we do have some over here. We do have some here, but um, not much. So it's more correlated over here. What about homocysteine? Homocysteine is a whole nother level, but it's addressable. That's the point of it. This is addressable. And we find that, do we have a correlation? Mostly higher over here. What we want is ideally six would be perfect. Conventionally, they say get under 11. So all of these are out of range until this point, and these are lower. So there is a looser correlation. What about inflammation? Higher here, lower there. So it's a big deal. So you must be 8% of omega-3 to avoid heart disease, preformed sources of EPA, and particularly DHA, because that's the highest concentration in the brain for the human diet, to reach that level of blood of EPA and DHA. So you need to take it. You need to eat it, which is fish primarily, and it does come through other sources, but fish primarily, and um, supplementing. ALA is poorly converted to DHA, and there's a number of studies on that. Again, back to where we started, it's difficult to convert from ALA to EPA and then on to DHA. So what's the point? The point is to know your levels, meaning get tested. Change your diet if you have to, pretty straightforward, or supplement with omega-3s to get your numbers into an appropriate ratio. You can do this, it's important, it will change your life. So when we talk about the seasonality of going from omega-3 to omega-6, in terms of late summer, early spring, what happens? Well, that's when the fruits come out. So fructose, which we talk about, oh, fructose. We have a fructose problem. Fructose is the cause of high uric acid, which is the cause of gout, which is the cause of dementia, which is the cause of yada, 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 heart disease. It is, all those things are true. But the fructose was actually an evolutionary gift. It was toxic. Can you imagine not being able to eat fruit? Think of, if you can't eat fruit because it's toxic, because you can't digest the fructose, well, that means you can't get the sugar, the glucose. And the glucose was the fire fuel. That was the fuel that made us go for the most part. We needed glucose. We also needed fat. That's ketones, different thing. But we couldn't access that glucose. When we evolved, to finally be able to digest some fructose, not a lot, that was a miracle. Suddenly it opened up the door to the glucose that's in the fruit, and some of the fructose we could convert to glucose. Amazing, that was a big win, about 14 million years ago. So some people are bored with that win, but that's it. So now along comes a situation in which we have so much fructose in our diet, usually high fructose corn syrup, but that's really only sugar, it's sucrose, but we have it all over the place, it's become so cheap. So now we're flooded with fructose. So this evolutionary gift, which allowed us to digest fructose, it's become a curse because we're limited. Talked about the polyol pathway and the, the myth of the uh, fructose finally exposed in previous videos. But the good thing about that polyol pathway or the sorbitol pathway, same name, same pathway, different name, is it allows us to take the fructose and convert it into fat. So come late summer and fall when we're eating the fruits, now we're talking about paleolithic time, we can pack on the fat because in the winter nothing grows. In the winter nothing's available. Nothing's available at all. And so we get to digest, we get, like a bear, we get to have our fat with us. And so the great apes and the humans, certainly they went into the northern latitudes, packed on the fats because they had to endure a winter to make it to the spring to once again get to the animals that were eating the omega-3s. Okay, 
So that was the good thing. But now we have fructose year round and we pack on the fats. So some people think the uric acid story ends right there. It's all about fructose. You just, you just showed us that it goes through this pathway that we have too much, that it goes to fat, but some of it can go to glucose. Yep, that's it. That's the story. But the thing is, what happens, what's the dividing line between fructose going to glucose that we can use immediately, to fructose going to fats or triglycerides? It's that the liver gets depleted. The liver gets depleted of phosphates. Not that you really need to know that, but ATP that you studied in high school, we all knew that. That's the, that's the cash, that's the coinage, that's the, the, that's the thing that we need to use, ATP, to power everything. So once we start running out of ATP, it breaks down. ATP breaks down into, pro, into purines. Ah, purines, the purine story. So that's what happens as we pack on the fat from too much fructose, from wherever the source is now, we are actually de depleting the liver. We're depleting the liver by fructose. But guess what else depletes the liver? Same pathway or the same usage of ATP. You have all these alcohol sugars, these polyols, same name. These polyols, when they come in, they deplete the liver as well. So what are the polyols? They're the xylitols, they're the mannose, and, they're, and so on and so forth. Um, and so sud suddenly, it's like another layer of fructose. We're depleting the liver even more, and we're packing on the fat because of that, right? It's depleting the liver, but it's creating a lot of purines. So excess fructose creates purines. The sorbitols, the sorbitols, well, that's an alcohol sugar, all the polyols or the alcohol sugars are depleting the liver. That's creating purines. And basically anything that the liver has to detoxify, it's using ATP, creates purines. So the story of elevated uric acid to gout that we've talked about before is all about purines, but you are making the purines. You're not eating them. You could say, okay, you're, you're having a high purine diet or and a few other things, but that really isn't the story Today, now, I'm taking you out of Paleolithic time and I'm putting you into 2022. I'm saying that is not the story. Some people, some people may overeat purines, but if they are not having any alcohol sugars, if they are not having any other toxins that your liver has to use ATP for, then they probably have an old-fashioned story, just too much purines that they're actually eating. But for most of us, but for most of us, the purine problem that we have that dries up the uric acid is all about overextending the liver. It's breaking down, it's storing the fructose, making it into a triglyceride. It is breaking down those the polyol sugars and turning it into fats. It is having to detoxify things. So anything that is using the ATP and depletes the liver of the DT, pushes it beyond its ability to deal with it, it breaks down to purines. So your purine problem is, or your gout problem is a purine problem. Your elevated uric acid is a purine problem. Your perhaps dementia or heart conditions, all those cardiometabolic conditions we talked about is a purine problem, but the question isn't where is your purines coming from in your diet? The question is, where is your purines coming from in the stuff your liver has to work on? The fructose first, and that was an environmental gift, right? We talked about being able to get the glucose and the fructose from things we couldn't eat before. Then the alcohol sugars, and then basically anything the liver has to detoxify. And we have a lot of that today in our environment. So the liver has got a lot of work to do, much more work than it signed up for 14 million years ago. We've taken it on a trip. It's getting depleted. And why do you think we all have fatty liver? Most people have fatty liver, not everybody, of course, which is measured on MRI. It's a real deal. So whether it's non-alcoholic fatty liver or fatty liver alcohol, it's the same context with or without the alcohol, so to say. It's still depleting the liver, which means you're breaking down the ATPs into purines. Your purines are not being able to be handled and they're turning into uric acid. So fructose, 
and other liver depleting sweeteners. This is the point that I'm trying to mention. Yes, know the story about fructose. Sucrose is really the story, right? Sucrose is glucose and fructose together. Boom. You hear about fructose, fructose, fructose. It is an issue and we're going to talk about that, but know how that is an issue. Okay. Okay. Fructose, the same amount of calories uh, and carbs as glucose and sucrose is 50-50. So for all your sugars, your table sugar, it's 50-50, fructose and glucose. But there are some major differences between them. Okay, let's talk about fructose. Key points, fructose is difficult to absorb, causes gas, bloating, diarrhea. Fructose raises blood sugar very slowly. This was always considered a good thing previously. Previously, meaning up to about five to 10 years ago, certainly. Fructose requires energy to metabolize, to be broken down. They thought that was a good thing. Uh, taxes the body of vitamins and minerals, raises triglycerides, aka fat, we're going to get into that. Glucose and fructose share the same molecular formula, but a different structure, resulting in stark differences in their metabolism. This makes a huge difference in how they are used in the body. Fructose must be metabolized by the liver prior to providing energy for working cells. So it really needs to be broken down and handled, if you will. That's why before, evolutionarily, it was toxic. We finally got to the point we could break it down and use some of it. We'll get into that. Okay, using energy stores in its metabolism. Whereas glucose is the only immediate source of energy for working cells and used in every cell of the body. Okay, fructose, glucose, same formula, different structure, pentagonal, hexagonal. Okay, excess dietary fructose should be avoided as much as possible due to its side effects. So excess, you don't just, now that it is an independent sweetener that you can get at Starbucks or wherever, don't just add it. It's not a sweetener. It's not a clever little thing to do anymore. That was misinformation. That was propaganda for the last 70 years. But a small amount of naturally occurring fructose found in fruits is completely acceptable. And there you can go if you really want to dig into it. Plenty of research and studies to back that up. Okay, here's what I want you to know is that fructose can be converted into glucose. That was a real win. Evolutionarily, that was a gift. Can you imagine when fructose was toxic? You couldn't eat fruit. There's the sugar your body could use, but you couldn't break down the fructose. And so therefore, none of that was accessible. Once the fructose became something we could break down, all that glucose was available. That's a big win, evolutionarily speaking. But when we take fructose, it takes a lot of work to break it down to glucose. And in that, it uses ATP. ATP as it breaks down, ATP to AMP to ADP, da 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 da, eventually creates purines and creates uric acid. So you are making, as fructose gets to be too much for the body, it depletes the ATP, as does other things we'll show in a second. But I want you to see that. So some fructose is good, a lot is bad. Here's a, another perspective on that. Fructose, pentagonal, ATP, it's using up the ATP, depleting phosphate. So ATP is adenosine triphosphate, it's losing phosphate, so it gets used up and it makes fats. So fats we store. Now it's become actually a bonus. We can store future calories, right? That was the whole thing, just like a bear, when we had to do the same thing. That's from 2018. This is not old news. Okay, the case for fructose. Our consumption has gone through the roof over the last 70 years. Obesity and high fructose corn syrup. High fructose corn syrup is not so much higher in fructose. It's cheaper and made all of this amount of sugar, sucrose, overwhelm our dietary supply of processed foods. So fructose, you can see from 1961, did increase. Here's where the high fructose corn syrup started and independent individual fructose packets, if you will. Adding those two together, that's what boosted up the fructose, but a little bit overall. Here's the prevalence of obesity. You can see where it went to about here and then really started to crank up after the easy and ubiquitous sucrose was everywhere and the individual fructose. This was never available in great quantity, the fructose, like it is today. It is a very big reason for the increase of both the rates of gout over the last 40 years, over the last 40 years, the quadrupling, and of uric acid levels increasing. Pretty straightforward. It's getting to be kind of an old story. Here you have total caloric sweeteners. Here's refined sugars drop down, but what is replacing it? The refined sugars are the sugar beets or sugar cane. That was all there was. And now the high fructose corn syrup became so cheap. Let's use that. All the products became cheap for sodas or donuts or frostings, whatever. That's where it jumped in. High fructose corn syrup replaced sugar 
because it was cheaper, incredibly cheap. Okay, the US intake versus obesity prevalence, 1980 to 2013, pretty straightforward. Obesity zoomed up. Here's the percent using artificial sweeteners. Look at that. We're going to talk about that in a second. Artificial sweeteners. Artificial sweeteners. What are they? Okay, and that was from NHANES, which is the NIH. Amazing. Okay, high fructose corn syrup, you know it's in everything from Oreos to Doritos to whatever that soft drink is, ginger ale, ketchup, et cetera, et cetera. Where does that come from? You know where it comes from. Sucrose, sugar. So whether it's sugar beets or whether it's sugar cane, it's sucrose. It's 50% fructose. So when we say high fructose corn syrup, we're getting into it in a second. Just think about it, it's 50-50. High fructose corn syrup, sucrose, is marginally higher in fructose than glucose. So this pathway evolved strictly as a seasonally useful way of putting on the fat. Remember, in the winter, we just don't have anything to eat. But if we've put on a lot of fat in the late summer, in the fall, by, by all the fructose things, the fruit and the omega-6, of course, that's a good thing because we're going to eat our fat away through the winter and be thin by spring. So this is the, this is in your liver. This is the polyol or sorbitol pathway. It goes glucose, sorbitol, fructose. Glucose, sorbitol, fructose, and then off to the fats. High fructose corn syrup, again. But now we're, it's feeding in glucose at both ends. Fructose, glucose. One thing is there's three tissues in the body that cannot go beyond sorbitol. So it goes glucose, gets all that high glucose out of the bloodstream. Great, good move. Puts it into sorbitol, and then it's supposed to go into fructose and then into fat, but your the retina of your eye, where you receive light, vision, basically, and the lens of your eye, and your uh, kidney cells. They cannot go beyond sorbitol, so consequently, all the glucose gets converted to sorbitol, and the concentration of sorbitol gets more and more and more. Kills kidney cells, it kills, gives you cataracts in your lenses, and it gives you diabetic, uh, diabetic blindness. It blinds you in the retina of your eye. So those tissues do die little by little. So the backup plan to get all that glucose out of the bloodstream into fructose and then converting it into fat has become a problem. It, we got boxed in. So we've had such a demand of getting the glucose out to fructose, but we're also getting all this fructose. Now we're boxed in. Plan B, as I call it, often makes things worse and in fact makes them toxic. All of that fructose, as I showed you, right, goes into breaking down the ATP and all those ATPs broken down or purines crank up and they get converted into uric acid in the tissues that cannot convert glucose to fructose. Okay, difference between table sugar and high fructose corn syrup. There's not much. So sucrose 50-50, they call it high fructose corn syrup of one variety is actually low in fructose because they're trying to make it lower, you know, not so much high. Um, high fructose corn syrup, 55, it's marginally different. In table sugar, glucose, fructose are combined into a single molecule called sucrose and high fructose corn syrup, a mixture of glucose and fructose molecule, separate but also together as sucrose. Natural sweeteners, look how high they are. All this orange is fructose. So composition of common caloric sweeteners. These are all the natural ones. Honey, sucrose, grape juice, high fructose corn syrup, of course, apple juice concentrate, agave nectar, up to 75% fructose. So you really don't want to be doing these at all. Now let's get to some of the artificial ones. Fructose raises uric acid. We've known this from the 1960s. Fresh fruit, more concentrated dry fruit, more concentrated table sugar, more concentrated corn syrup, 55, 10, 40, 50, 55. Do you see how that goes? So that's not new news. Let's compare the actual fruits. So if you're having actual fruits, yeah, there's a problem if you're having a lot of them, but there's a lot of benefits in there too. So here's just basically measuring from high to low fructose. Right? So the highest fructose fruits that most people have are pears and apple, and they're very related. Look over here. When you look at the amount of sugar in an apple, 19 to 20 grams of sugar, 10 grams of fructose, about 50%. And even though we think of a banana being all sugar, banana has very little in the way of fructose and mostly glucose. Still, you got a problem, right? Too much glucose goes to fructose, so you're back to that all again. And too much fructose goes to breaking down purines, uh, creating purines by breaking down ATP. Back to that again. Okay, of these components, the sucrose, glucose, fructose, right here, became the biggest culprit to raising uric acid for most people, but not for everybody. This is the story we're being told now. We're saying, gosh, this is it. We've ignored it. It's like we should stop smoking cigarettes. I think we kind of knew that a long time ago. Yes, that is a reality, 
But what's not being told, the problem is this is such a large story that all the other supportive and more likely stories of people creating their own purines and getting their own gout has nothing to do with a high purine diet and probably does have to do with fructose if people are on the standard American diet. But there's another way that I want to show you about. But here is the traditional way now of looking at it. Now there's three variables, fructose, alcohol, and high purine diets. All those will increase your uric acid. That's the standard story you'll get nowadays of a partially enlightened medical doctor. But what I'm saying is it went this way. From the time of Hippocrates, 500 years BC, which is about 2,500 years ago now, the causes of gout and elevated uric acid had changed. Originally, it was two variables, high purines and high alcohol, to the degree they had alcohol. And they had plenty of wine and they probably learned to distill it. We know they had plenty of beer, right? So there you go, two variables. Well, now the enlightened conventional medical perspective is three variables, high purines, high alcohol or alcohol, and high fructose, corn syrup, high fructose, AKA processed foods, soda, energy drinks. For the standard American diet, there you go. That probably is the reality for 90% of them. However, there's a fourth variable that's not discussed because it makes things a little blurry, if you ask me. So the reality for many of us is the fourth variable through the last 70 years, which leads to gout. This was the three variable, the fourth variable we're gonna talk about. Did we go from bad, high fructose corn syrup, inexpensive sucrose, the story I've just told you, to worse, alcohol sugars, the polyol story of artificial sweeteners. I think we did. So alcohol sugars are also called polyol. So here we go. Now that the sorbitol, the xylitol, the maltitol, the isomalt, lactitol, mannitol, and it's mannitol, not mannose. I mentioned mannose in the other clip, and erythritol. So the reason they became so popular is because they tasted sweet and there were fewer calories. So, wow, that's magic. Well, it's not so much magic actually anymore. One's even called sorbitol. So can you imagine adding sorbitol to somebody who already has uh, the problems we've talked about? Mind-blowingly stupid. Okay, let's get into it. All right, fructose. Both lead to increased purine uh, purine creation. So fructose, I've told you all about that. Fructose gets broken down uses up your ATP, I'm not going through all this, breaks down to purines, increases your uric acid. Guess what? Xylitol does the same thing. Xylitol does the same thing. So for all these people that go, I'm so smart, I'm not gonna do high fructose corn syrup, I'm not even gonna do sugar, I'm so smart, I'm gonna do xylitol. Well, you've just stepped into the stupid box. And that's the way it goes. Xylitol is just as bad. There's good things to say about xylitol, but not in this context. It does decrease carries because it doesn't feed those same bacteria in your mouth, meaning cavities. But in this case, a lot of people have switched to xylitol and they've not diminished their gout or elevated uric acid. So the story was, initially it was diet and maybe a little alcohol, but the results today is fructose, yes, and xylitol, representing all of the alcohol sugars, by the way, cause an overproduction of uric acid. So it's fructose and xylitol and sorbitol and mannitol. I have no specific information on erythritol and people ask me that a lot. I am suspicious, came out in 20, 2001, erythritol. Corporations and pharmaceutical companies are not very transparent, just like for all the other artificial sweeteners of sucralose and, and so on. It wasn't for a couple decades afterwards that they realized that there were toxic. Anyway, I couldn't find any overtly, clearly good research on erythritol. So we'll put that one out temporarily. So xylitol, there you go. Germany came out in 1891. It's actually pretty old. You can get it by the pound. You can get it by the barrel if you want to. When it was discovered, rediscovered during World War II, when Finland was suffering from a shortage of sugar, table sugar, during this time, the Finnish began using xylitol as a substitute, and they got it from the uh, bark of birch trees. Xylitol is commercially produced from birch bark and corn cobs, and that's why it's very cheap in the United States, another corn derivative. Great story though. Okay, sorbitol, mannitol, they're pretty much the same thing. If you look at the structure here, the only difference is specifically where they have their one particular bond, so they're nearly identical. And when I show you this, we're talking about this one here and this one here, uh, mannitol technically has fewer carbs. Don't get sucked into it. High fructose corn syrup, again, 
this is causing us the problem, right? And so the plan B doesn't work in some parts of the body. Boom, boom, boom. Lens of your eye, the retina of your eye, your nerve cells. I left that one out. That's a big deal in your kidney. So you have neuropathy, nephropathy, neuropathy, retinopathy, which is blindness and cataracts. Sorbitol as a sweetener, which is actually approved by the ADA, American Diabetic Association, is like throwing gasoline on the fire of increasing serum uric acid. It's the stupidest thing to have. Erythritol, does erythritol raise uric acid? It's the big question. First commercially used in the United States, 2001. Little research is available, blocked if you ask me, like cigarettes. The only way to know really is to monitor your own levels. So if you're hoping the erythritol is gonna be your savior for sweeteners, then test it before and after. Find out for yourself that it affects you. Don't go, I read this research. You now can get a meter, get your meter yourself, go get a lab test, however you wanna get it done. Find out for yourself. That's, that's the way out of here. So get tested at a lab or test yourself. This is how we do it. I've mentioned this a number of times. Here's the numbers you wanna shoot for. Women, men, these are the other labs. We do it ourselves. It's important. It really is important. There's a link to this in the, in the description. Of, uh, of this particular video, as well as there's a link to Ulta Labs where you can get your labs done for your own. I don't get a penny out of it, um, and I would suggest you do it. A lot of people have done that, and I think it's just great. Learn about your labs, learn to test yourself, learn about, it. it's your own responsibility. And this is what that looks like. This is us first starting it, and um, we're now getting more discipline. We're doing a fasting one, and so I'll be covering this in a little more regimented, uh, variables. This was all over the place, just getting used to it. Uric acid, ketones, cholesterol, glucose, I think is important. So here we are, mid-October, eastern North Carolina. By the way, it's at the exact same latitude as Crete. And so we kind of refer this to our Cretan diet, just by luck. Here we have grapes that have obviously gone, gone by. The grapes go by, we're just playing with them, late summer, right? Late summer. Fructose, grapes, late summer. Now over here, we're looking at figs. Another rather Cretan standard dietary thing. Figs. When do they come out? They come out here in eastern North Carolina about late, mid to late July. So summer. Fructose. You can store figs. So the point is, there's a seasonality to fructose. Fructose is not a spring thing. It's not a winter thing in the Paleolithic context that I'm telling you about. But that's natural. And so finally we get to have a fruit and in the fruit, I get some sugar that's converted from the fructose to all oh, that glucose is in there. I am rich because food is hard to come by and suddenly I get this incredible plant or that incredible plant. And the third one would be olives, of course, in Crete, which has the oldest, olive plant in the world, but they're big in olive oils and olive oil provides a whole nother thing. That's a mono unsaturated, but it's a good fat to have. So you got the seasonality aspect that we now are stuck in the world of not being in that seasonality anymore. And yet we have a system being able to break down some fructose into glucose and then make it into fat, store it for later consumption that is terrible. It not only cranks up our uric acid, which obviously is one of the problems for obesity, type 2 diabetes, cardiometabolic, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but it is a problem from everything. So that gift of evolution to get a little fructose that is no longer toxic so we can get that glucose has become a problem. And then we have the sugar alcohols and then we have all the other toxins in this environment that didn't exist back then. Hope that helps. So since we're talking about seasonality, I sort of have to confess, we are working on a project here of elderberries. And so far we have about eight plants, elderberries, but when do elderberries actually bury? They bury pretty much late summer. Again, it's fructose and there are almost no glucose berry. There are fructose and other things. But this, again, if you want to think of yourself as a bear that has to eat all the berries and get fat so it can go hibernate, it's still the same thing we're talking about. It's still the omega-6, if you're eating the grains of late fall, 
of late fall, of late summer, late fall, whether you're eating the berries of late summer or late fall for the fructose, it's making you fat either way. So here is our six plants of elderberries. They're just in the first year, so of course they're small. But next year there'll be six, oh, uh, six to eight feet tall, and a couple we have over there. But it is a wonderful harvest of late summer, early fall. That's the point of this is when those harvest things happen. That's when the fructose is high, late summer, early fall. That's when the omega-6 is high for the grains and so on, late summer, early fall that has to be harvested. Times have changed. It's not just fructose of the good old days from fruits, which are what these are. It's the fructose from the, high, from the sugars that we suddenly have in everything, including, including your coleslaw and in, including things you probably, in, in your meat, your processed meat, if you were to go to the deli, it would have fructose, high fructose corn syrup in the meat for some reason. Who knows why? Well, we can guess why. But that's the problem. We have it out of seasonality for one, but when you add that into the other artificial sugars, which I'm calling the alcohol sugars, and then you add that into the other environmental toxins that demand your liver to detoxify them, the fuel for detoxification and all the different pathways that the liver has is primarily the ATP by making any of those pathways work. And we deplete that, we make purines. We make purines, we elevate our uric acid. We elevate our uric acid year round. That's a problem. Times have changed. Till next time. So if this is something that you're interested in, that is a topic that I obviously go deeper in, in terms of labs, in terms of how to do it, in terms of why you would want to do it, various topics, as you've seen that I've done in the past, then please let me know below in a comment. Till then.